we continue from the point that we stopped at in the previous lecture, <coughs> namely the discussion of the characterization of a linear shift invariant system. Recall that in the previous lecture, we made the following conclusions about a linear shift invariant system. In fact, we started building up our conclusions by including the assumptions one by one. Let's just quickly retrace the sequence of steps to complete our discussion in this lecture. We started by looking at a function that was continuous, which could serve as an input signal to the LSI system. right? And we said that the input signal could be thought of as comprised of individual pulses of very narrow width. And just a little correction in that context, maybe I think I, after I thought over what I discussed in the previous lecture, I thought I should make just a little correction, not a serious one, but something that was mathematically inaccurate. I had said that if you consider a particular interval here of width delta and center at t0, and this function was x of t, then we constructed the function delta delta t minus t0 right and we said this multiplied by x of x at t0 summed over t0 could reconstruct the function x of t now there was just a little correction because this function delta delta had the following nature so this function delta t minus t0 would appear like this. It would have a height of 1 by delta and a width of delta and it would be centered at t0. Now since the height is 1 by delta, we need to take care of that height by multiplying this by delta. Just a little correction. And in fact, this, you know, serves to complete the link between this and the process of integration. Because if you recall, we later said that as you make delta become smaller and smaller, this tends to the integral x. So this, you know, as delta becomes smaller and smaller, as delta tends to 0, this tends towards integral x lambda delta t minus lambda d lambda <coughs> and this element of integration essentially is the limit of this capital delta as delta tends towards zero. So just that little correction is needed to go from the summation to the integration. right? I mean it does not change materially the nature of our argument, it only corrects the uh, you know relationship precisely between the integral and the summation. Okay. Now we, you see, based on this, I mean, we just recall, based on this, we had seen that an arbitrary input xt to an LSI system can therefore be thought of as a linear combination of many, many tiny little impulses. So we said, if you think of, you know, one way to interpret this xt is equal to integral x lambda delta t minus lambda d lambda is to understand that the input xt is a linear combination of many many impulses located at different lambdas and then suitably stitched together to form xt through linear combination. So here we should interpret x of lambda as a coefficient of linear combination and delta t minus lambda as an object, a mathematical object as a function of t. I said mathematical object because it is not really a function in the true sense. right? Now we said that you know in a linear system if we know the output corresponding to delta t minus lambda for a linear system Of course, 
we expect the output will be a function of two parameters. Of course, it will be a function of t, but it will also be a function of lambda. So, for every different impulse, there is going to be a different output, right? I mean, for an impulse located at every different point, lambda, there will be a different output as a function of time. That's what we mean by writing h of t comma lambda. Now, in general, for a linear system, this is if we know this input output mapping that is for every impulse located at a point lambda you know what the corresponding output function is then you can find out the output by making the same linear combination this is the output for a, for a linear system here we don't assume shift in variance Now, if we wish to assume shift in variance, then let's let's right make the change right here. So, if the system is also linear and shift in variant, then the following holds. You see, if delta t results in h t for the linear shift in variant system. And we gave this a name. We called HT the impulse response of the system for obvious reasons. It is the response of the system to an impulse input. And of course, we understand here an impulse input located at 0 with a strength of 1. Yeah? In that case, if the system is linear and shift invariant, then if I shift the impulse by lambda, the output of the impulse response is also shifted by lambda and therefore instead of ht comma lambda I obtain ht minus lambda the lambda as the output right now here we need to look at this expression in a little more depth right with a little more care Let's just recall the conclusions, the specific or the very significant points that we had emphasized in this context. One point was that for an LSI system, a linear shift invariant, now in future we shall abbreviate linear shift invariant by LSI. Okay? So for an LSI system, this leads us to conclude that if I know the response to a unit impulse located at t equal to 0, I know the behavior of the system completely because I can obtain the output for any input. Now, strictly speaking, we haven't shown this rigorously because when we talked about the stitching together and producing the function xt from impulses, we assumed a continuous function. But one can show that the same idea can be carried over to functions that are discontinuous as well, as well. Right? So even if the function is discontinuous, one can carry over a similar idea or one can extend this idea of stitching together the impulses and producing xt, okay? And then this, these arguments carry forth as it is. Now I must in addition to what I had emphasized in the previous lecture, bring out a few more important points now. The first point is that the impulse response can be found for any system. It is not correct to say that the impulse response can be obtained only for linear shift invariant systems. This is a common pitfall to the beginner. After this discussion, a lot of people tend to conclude that it is only for linear shift invariant systems that we can find an impulse response. That is not true. One can find an impulse response for a wide class of systems. The only difficulty is if the system is not linear shift invariant, the impulse response does not characterize the system completely. So you may find the impulse response for any system and it might give you some output signal, ht, 
that HT is not a complete characterization for systems other than LSI systems. Point number one. Point number two. It is only for LSI systems that the linear shift in very uh, that the impulse response is a complete characterization. Now, what it means is for an arbitrary system, even if I find the impulse response, it does not tell me too much about the system. It's just any other input output pair. It does not characterize the system completely. Right? These two points need to be emphasized because they are common errors to a beginner. When we discuss it in this framework, we don't, of course, realize how serious I am saying is. But I have known in the past a number of instances where people working with systems, I mean beginners working with systems, find the impulse response when the system is either not linear or when it is not shift invariant, perfectly fine, nothing wrong with that, but use that to characterize the system. That is troublesome. Right? Now, we need to look at this relationship a little more in depth. You see, it tells me, this relationship is a very powerful one. It tells me that this function HT gives me everything that I want to know about the system. And in fact, this also tells me that the output yt, the input xt and the impulse response ht are related in some way. So we will say yt is some function, I will now I'll capture that function in script s. So I will say s of xt ht. There is some functional relationship. Now I must emphasize, here we are talking about a functional relationship between two functions, between two signals. It is not a functional relationship between two points, two values. These are not numbers, they are themselves signals. So what we are saying is that the output signal is some function of the input signal and the impulse response, right? There is a question from Abhishek, yes, Abhishek. Make sure the mic is on when you ask the question. So is it also sufficient condition to say that is a, it defines the LSA system? What is sufficient? Uh, so the condition uh, we derive y, uh, yt equal to uh, integral x lambda uh, ht minus ah, lambda. Ah, okay. Very good. Yeah, very good. All right, that's a very good question. The question is, is it also sufficient to characterize an LSI system? That means, if I know that the input and output are related in this manner through the impulse response, does it characterize an LSI system completely? It, the answer is yes, we shall prove that. Yeah, we shall prove that. Now let me just finish this discussion. So, um, you see what we have done here is to show that the input function, the input signal is operated upon in some manner by the impulse response to produce the output. So here we have an operation between two signals. Now for example, a simple operation between two signals could be the sum. So you can have the sum xt plus ht. Another possible operation between two signals can be the product or you can have a product of one signal with the other signal delayed. So for example, you could have xt plus h of t minus 1, sum of the signal and a delayed version of the other, a product of one signal and a delayed version of the other. These are all examples of operations between two signals, right? Now you can also have another operation, you can, you can integrate this for a certain amount of time, you can have a certain say from 0 to 5, that is also an operation between two signals. I am giving you examples of operations between two signals. Now what we are saying is that yt is an operation between two signals here, the signal xt and the signal ht and this operation has a very important role to play in the study of systems. This operation is called convolution. 
so we say yt is obtained by the convolution of xt and ht how do we describe the convolution yt is obtained at every point t by this integral so we say that xt and ht are convolved produce y I must emphasize a few points here note that I have not written xt here intentionally I have written x dot the reason behind that is that you know it emphasizes that it's the whole signal which is involved not just the point x of t it must also be understood that for every point t on the output there is a different integral here so potentially for every point t you have a different integral to be computed so it's a very you know it's a, it's a rather elaborate situation you see so we need to appreciate this thoroughly for for every point t on the output there is a different integral to be computed because this changes right wonder why this operation is called convolution i think we should give some background to that you see in common parlance in common language convolve actually means to twist and to mix together right convolve means to twist and to mix together if you look at it in a certain way this is exactly what you are doing to the two functions this is some kind of a twisting you know twisting the function in a peculiar way and this is some kind of a mixing right so you know it's in fact now when we actually calculate convolutions you will see it really gives the impression of twisting and mixing the functions together so in fact you know the the more common verb in the english language is to convolute convoluted see when you say there is a convoluted argument presented it means it's a highly twisted a highly complicated and a highly undecipherable argument in a lighter vein people tend to find the operation of convolution equally difficult to grasp right in the beginning and probably that's one of the reasons why that name has also been accepted however let me assure you that convolution is a very simple operation and we'll see examples to prove the point now let's take an example you see we'll intentionally you know take an example of a circuit that we know and calculate the impulse response so we'll proceed now before i do that i think i should now answer abhishek's question suppose i know that the input and output are related in this manner that is yt is indeed equal to you know xt convolved with ht that means this is the relationship x of lambda h of t minus lambda does it make my system linear and shift invariant right so is it also true the converse way we shall prove that it is so indeed let there be two different inputs so let x1 now you know in future we shall use the shorthand notation let x1 and 2 of t respectively produce y1 of y1 and 2 of t according to this relationship right let x1 and 2 of t produce y1 and 2 of t according to this relationship now if we consider the input a x1 t plus b x2 t then what will be the entry here it will be a x1 lambda plus b x2 lambda multiplied by h t minus lambda d lambda
Now we may decompose this. So we may we may split this into two parts. this is equal to a y1 t plus b y2 t. So clearly the system obeys the property of superposition and then the system is linear. Now we shall prove its shift in variance. To prove that, we need to look at this operation of convolution in a little more depth. Now, of course, one can, you know, prove it starting from this expression. But it will be easier for us to first prove a property of convolution and then prove the shift in variance of this expression, right? So now, this is the question that we can ask is, you see, convolution is an operation between two signals. So a lot of questions can be asked about operations. For example, when you add two signals, it doesn't matter in which order you add them whether it's xt plus ht or ht plus xt. When you multiply two signals, it doesn't matter in which order you multiply them. <coughs> Similarly, you might ask, if I convolve two signals, does it matter in which order I convolve? So if I, if I forget about the fact that xt is the input to the system and ht is an, is an impulse response, if I just think of them as two signals in their own right, this is an operation between two signals. So we can ask the question, does it matter to change the order of the operands? Now we shall prove that it does not. That means convolution is commutative. It can, it is equivalent to convolve. So whether we convolve xt with ht or ht with xt, the result is the same. We shall prove that. Yeah. Now indeed, consider ht convolved with xt. In fact, now we shall also give the operation of convolution a symbol. We shall give this symbol. The star is a symbol for convolution. Right? So consider h convolved with x. How will it appear? It will appear as integral h say lambda x t minus lambda d lambda. Now of course the limits of the integral here are in general, you see, in general the limits of the integration here are over all lambda from minus infinity to plus infinity. Let's make a change of variable. So let, let's put, now you must remember that in this integral t is a constant. For every t you have a different integral. So let's put the change of variable t minus lambda is phi. So we have lambda is t minus phi. Now when lambda runs from minus infinity to plus infinity for a fixed t phi also runs from plus infinity to minus infinity. And you have a d lambda element here. Clearly from here d lambda is minus d phi. 
So the limits here go from plus infinity to minus infinity and the element of integration has a negative sign. So we may retain the same limits and keep the uh, element without the negative sign. So we may write this down as minus infinity to plus infinity. Now we have x of 5, h of t minus 5, d5, phi, d5. Phi. Now compare this expression with this, it's identical. It doesn't matter what we call the variable of integration. And therefore, h convolved with x is equal to x convolved with h. And therefore, the operation of convolution is commutative, right? So, we will say convolution is commutative. Now it is based on this that we shall show the shift in variance of the system. So in this system, instead of choosing to write x of lambda, h of t minus lambda, it is perfectly acceptable for me to write h of lambda, x of t minus lambda, because convolution is commutative. Now let the input to the system be x of t minus t0. The output according to this would be integral. So let, 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 let x of t minus t0 be equal to g of t. Right? The output is going to be according to this description h of lambda g t minus lambda d lambda. But g of t minus lambda is x of t minus t0 minus lambda. So you see what do we do? See in g of t, so in place of t here I put t minus lambda. So t minus lambda minus t0 d lambda. But this is clearly equal integral h lambda x t minus t0 minus lambda d lambda. Yeah? Which of course is equal to y of t minus t0. And therefore, the system obeys shift invariance because when I shift the input by t0, the output is also shifted by t0. Therefore, this relationship between the input and the impulse response is necessary and sufficient to guarantee linearity and shift invariance. Right? It is necessary and sufficient that the input be convolved with the impulse response for the system to be linear and shift invariant. if we can find examples of the impulse response. Let's take a very simple case first. Let's take a purely resistive system. Let's take an electrical system with the following configuration, just a pair of resistors. Let's 
this is the resistance of value R1, this is the resistance of value R2. This is the input, it's a voltage, input voltage, and this is the output voltage. Now, this is a transparent example. What I mean by a transparent example is, we almost, we know what the output, we know what the answer is. We are just, you know, working it out formally to understand the notion of an impulse response a little more thoroughly. Right? So, how can we calculate the impulse response here? Well, let's start with a pulse input. See, what, what do you mean by an impulse response? A response to an impulse. So, how do I get an impulse? I could get it by the limit of a pulse. So, let me start with a pulse. Let me apply a pulse here at the input of height. So, this, you know, this pulse has a width of delta and a height of 1 by delta. Clearly, the output here, it's very clear that the output is going to be also a pulse of width delta, but the height is going to be modified to 1 by delta multiplied by R2 divided by R2 plus R1. take limits. So, take the limit as delta tends to 0. And corresponding limit here as delta tends to 0. This would of course give me delta t. And what would this give me? This would give me r2 by r1 plus r2 times that function. Right? So, it would give me r2 by r2 plus r1 times delta t. This is h t. <coughs> right? So, so it is a very simple example. In fact, this system also has, it is of course linear, it is the most trivial example of a linear shift invariant system. It is clearly linear, there is no argument about that. In fact, it is shift invariant and memoryless. The system is memoryless, right? Now, let us make the system a little more complicated. Let us instead of a resistor put a capacitor here. So now the situation is a little more complicated. Okay. Now you see there are various ways in which we can find the impulse response. Let us find it by using the same principle. Let us find the response to a pulse and then let us extend it as delta tends to 0 to find the response to an impulse. Now, how can I find the response to a pulse in the circuit? There are, of course, one can do it in a complicated way. But a very simple way is to take the pulse as a sum of two steps. One like this, another like this. Displaced by delta. Right. So we have a positive. Now just visualize. You have an input here, which is zero up to the point, up to this point, and then rises to one by delta here. Okay. You have another input which is zero up to this point, and falls to minus one by delta here. Okay. If I add the, 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 these points of rise and fall are separated by delta. So when I add these, it's very clear that you get the pulse. Yeah. And from our elementary knowledge of electrical circuits, it's not very difficult to find the response to this. 
and here though I can formally show it it's very clear that the system is shifting variant it is linear why is it linear because if I have two different of course needless to say I'm taking the voltage across the capacitor as the output yeah needless to say if I have two x1 t and x2 t and I find the corresponding output voltages y1 t and y2 t then a linear combination of the voltages here will produce the same linear combination of the voltages there we know that from our knowledge of electrical circuits right so the system is linear it is also shift invariant because if I simply happen to shift the input by a certain amount in time the only effect on the output will be to shift the output by the same amount of time in fact this we reason more from our understanding of electrical circuits we've been dealing with these circuits all the while without realizing they are examples of linear shift invariant systems now before I proceed to calculate the impulse response it might be worthwhile making a few remarks as to why the concept of linearity and shift invariance is relevant and also not fully correct here right let's see both the concepts clearly now first the concept of linearity you see when you talk about a capacitor what is the assumption that you're making when you assume it is linear the assumption is that as you keep increasing the charge yes yes Amir, yeah what is the assumption that you're making yeah when you yeah quickly pass the mic to him yeah so there's an input from Samir so about the linearity of the system yeah yes Samir yeah so we assume that the capacitor is initially uncharged otherwise it won't be a linear system very good. very good that's perfectly correct we also we assume the system is what about what about a more you see I mean let me ask the class again let me ask Samir again all right let's assume the capacitor is initially uncharged even then is it you know if you look at the capacitor as a device is it fully correct to assume it is linear now let's look at it a little more critically you know what are we saying when you say it's linear what are you saying about the charge voltage relationship yeah Yes, yes, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, is there some, yeah? Okay. But leakage currents don't really make it non linear because you can put a resistance. Yes, yes, Sudhai. So the charge should vary continuously, there should be no certain. You see, we assume the charge voltage relationship is linear, right? <coughs> see, just as an inductor, in an inductor, when you say the inductor behaves linearly, you are assuming that the relationship between current flowing through and flux established is linear. Now that assumes that the magnetic field is not saturated, the core is not saturated. Something similar can be said of the dielectric. Yeah, the electric field, see voltage relates to electric field. So the way in which the electric field is established between the plates and the amount of charge put may start showing non-linearity or may start showing a non-proportional relationship after a while. So that's where the capacitor starts becoming non-linear. So what I'm trying to say is the capacitor is both linear and non-linear depending on the range in which you're operating. Now that's about linearity. You see, if I keep putting charge on the capacitor, it might come a point where the dielectric breaks down and then linearity is lost. That's an extreme case. But there might be situations where the electric field does not increase proportionally to the charge. Their linearity is lost. So you see, this idea of linearity does and at the same time does not have a relevance in physical systems, as this example illustrates. Right? Linearity is very meaningful in the sense by assuming the system is linear and by analyzing the system as a consequence we do come with very useful conclusions about this RC circuit but if we wish to look at the situation in its complete entirety then we cannot say 100% with confidence that it is linear for these reasons right now this also in fact I thought I should liken this to the situation of Newtonian and Einsteinian physics you see we know that Einstein recommends thinking of space-time as one entity and also recommends thinking of velocities, masses, all in a relativistic framework. So, you know, we, we must understand the velocities relatively, we must understand even the idea of mass relatively, right? So, you see, the whole idea of being able to discuss, you know, 
a body as a body, an object as an object, has certain objectionable or has certain problems in the context of Einsteinian physics. But still, in the context of Newtonian physics, we accept the idea of bodies, their velocities, their accelerations, and so on. And we deal with them in a simplistic framework. Right? And perfectly meaningful. In fact, we get very, very meaningful results from Newtonian physics. They help us predict the behavior of bodies in a large context in our experience. And we, even though we have the benefit of Einsteinian physics today, we don't discard Newtonian mechanics. In fact, we retain it in all its entirety in our first understanding of physical systems. The same thing here. In a first understanding of systems, it is perfectly meaningful to retain the assumptions of linearity and shift invariance because they help us draw very useful conclusions up to a point. <coughs> Beyond that point, when one starts looking at microscopic phenomena, when one starts looking at very large scale or very small scale phenomena, one does need to sacrifice one's assumptions of linearity and shift invariance. Right? Now, this is about linearity. What about shift invariance? You see, this circuit is shift invariant up to the point where the capacitors and resistors retain their properties in time. So, for example, the resistor can start growing old, the capacitor can start growing old, the dielectric may start decomposing or may start getting affected in time, the, the capacitor plates might start rusting right, or might be exposed to physical degradation. As a consequence, the capacitance or associated properties with the capacitor can change in time. The same with the resistance. Now, to that extent, this is not really a shift invariant system. Because if I happen to apply a certain input output, uh, if I happen to apply a certain input and observe the output today, after 10 years, that may not quite be the case, there might be some degradation. But that's a different scale of observation. If I observe the output after 10 seconds, or maybe after 10 minutes, or after 10 hours, we are unlikely to see much of a change. So even time invariance or shift invariance has a meaning in certain scales of operation. right? So I thought you should understand, besides understanding the mathematical implications of linearity and shift invariance, it is as important to understand their physical relevance and their physical ranges. right? A bit of philosophy, but very, very important because we must understand the context right from the beginning. Now, come down to brass tacks, let's come down to business, let's find out the impulse response of the system. Right? So, we'll make use of our knowledge. So, here I assume I'm speaking to electrical engineers, so I will make use of our knowledge of RC circuits. Well, I'm sure most engineers would also have an exposure to an analysis of a circuit like this, so it should not be too difficult to grasp. Right? So let's find what is the output, what, what kind of an output will this capacitor show when this is the input. This kind of an input will produce an output like this. The capacitor will initially of course have, the capacitor is initially uncharged. So it will start rising exponentially. And asymptotically it will approach 1 by delta. So the voltage in the capacitor will asymptotically reach the value 1 by delta. Right? If this were the input, the capacitor would asymptotically fall towards the value minus 1 by delta. write an expression for this. We can write this, ex the, this voltage across the capacitor is 1 by delta 1 minus e raised to the power minus t by tau. Ut. Where Ut is our traditional unit step. That's the voltage across the capacitor. 
বলতে যে কষ্ট write down this output this output would be 1 by delta 1 minus e raised to the power now note minus t minus delta by tau u t minus delta Is that right? Yeah? Minus 1 by delta. That's correct. It should be minus 1 by delta here. So what will be the result of the pulse? The sum of these two obviously and therefore the overall response to a pulse is going to be given by the sum of these. Let's write that down as well. <coughs> So we have 1 minus e raised to the power minus t by tau ut minus 1 minus e raised to the power minus t minus delta by tau. Of course needless to say tau is the product of r and c, yes? separate this into two parts. So let's separate this. We'll take the one terms first and we'll write 1 by delta ut minus ut minus delta as one part. And the other part is minus 1 by delta e raised to the power minus t by tau ut minus e raised to the power minus t minus delta by tau ut minus delta. look at these expressions separately. You see, let us look at this expression first. This is a little more tricky. This expression is relatively easier to handle. We will see that later. In fact, we can finish it off right away. You see, what is this expression really? Let me sketch this expression. This expression looks like this. Ut minus Ut minus delta looks like this. You see over a, over an interval of delta. Yeah, this is this is this part, and this is this. The height is one by delta. So in fact, this part is just an impulse. Yeah, this part is just an impulse. Now here you need to look at this a little more. Okay, let me. What we'll do is we'll sketch this function. Right? See, e raised to the power minus t by tau ut looks like this. Alright? And this looks like the same function but shifted forward by delta. 
But what we can do is we can extract e raised to the power minus t by tau common from here. So let's write this down. Let me rewrite this. Let me rewrite this as e raised to the power minus t by tau u t right minus e raised to the power minus t by tau e raised to the power delta by tau u t minus delta Now, what I shall do is, I shall not formally evaluate this. You know, we can we can do it. We can formally evaluate the limits and so on. Rather, let's get a feel of it intuitively. What what kind of an expression does this give you? Right? What kind of an expression does this give you? You see, if you look at this expression carefully, clearly, this part was leading to an impulse. Right? This part was giving us giving us an impulse. Right? What is this part giving you? I mean, let's sketch the output to understand. Let's sketch this function. It's a difference of two functions like this. You know, there's one function like this, e raised to the power minus t by tau u t. There's another function which is very similar but displaced by delta. Right, so you have this say minus. I'm, I'm expanding the scale, so I'll, I'll make delta. You know, I'll just expand the delta to make the point very clear. So you have this other function like this, also decaying. Both of them are multiplied by 1 by delta, right? So you're taking the difference of these two and it is being multiplied by 1 by delta. So, you know, so one, one should write this multiplied by 1 by delta and this multiplied by 1 by delta. So, you know, this height is 1 by delta here. Now visualize, visualize. What kind of a difference will this give us? What kind of a difference will this give us? Yeah, I mean, what, what do we expect is the difference here? Yeah, all right. Let's let's have some inputs from Samir. Yeah. So after delta, you will have a constant. Okay. So constant height equal, that 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 can be computed by taking the height at t equal to delta. Minus the height of the other of the lower function at t equal to delta, so that will be a constant. Uh, before that, you will have e raised to minus t by tau into uh, into the impulse function. So you have an impulse and a constant. So the impulse and a constant. All right. So let let me ask. So you know now now this is a you know this is a tricky visualization. I do. Sami definitely has a very valid. Now I'd like to get some more input. So would anybody else like to? What can you visualize? What this will give you as? You know, when you take the difference, and when you or when you add up these two functions, and when you take the limit, or you know, when you visualize what happens as delta becomes smaller and smaller, what do you think will happen as delta becomes smaller and smaller? So, Sami definitely has a very valid suggestion. I'd like some other people also to, you know, put up some thinking in this context. See, one thing is clear: if delta is large, if delta is large. Then you see, it'll, what kind of an appearance will it give you? It will give you an appearance as if you know you have. See, this function would have almost gone to zero. There, is it not? You have an appearance something like this. You know, it will look like this. 
and then it'll you know up to here it seems to go this way and then suddenly you have this you know so it'll, it'll have an appearance something like this can you see that i mean this is the this is what it will look like this is what it will look like when delta is large because you know by that time this function is very small so when you add these you know it will have an appearance like this now you can visualize the situation as this comes closer and closer yeah so what kind of an output does this give you now you must not forget that you see it's you must not forget that this height is also increasing this height is also increasing you know so one must not forget that now actually it can be shown that this tends as, as delta no this is a little counter intuitive this is a little counter intuitive what i'm going to say it can be shown that as you bring this closer and closer now you see there are two things happening one is that this you know this height is increasing right and of course this is you know the the problem is that you know as you bring this closer and closer this has not significantly dropped right on the other hand this is always stronger than this positive thing so the net is always less yeah so you see there are two things that become clear see one thing is that there seems to be a so there will be a concentration at zero right there will be a so there you can see that there is an impulsive behavior here you know as you make this smaller and smaller one impulse will start forming here because this height goes to infinity this width goes to zero there's an impulse part and there's also one part which remains as a consequence of decay so there's a you know you'll have an impulse plus a decaying component okay see one can visualize there'll be an impulsive part because you know you have this thing growing and this will becoming smaller so there's an impulsive part so there's an impulsive part and there is a decaying part so in fact as delta tends to zero this will have an appearance like this it would give you an impulse delta t and it will also give you a function of the form in fact precisely some constant now this is something which you know i i agree i have not proved but you know one can see there'll be a decaying part so we'll just accept there'll be a decaying part i leave this constant open for imagination right to have some the decaying part multiplied by some constant e raised to the power minus t by tau ut right and the other component now this is being subtracted so remember the other part gave us simply delta t so delta t minus this is the overall output so the overall impulse response will look something like a e raised to the power minus t by tau ut yeah now we shall prove this in fact we shall see here we have worked intuitively we have you know come to this conclusion intuitively we have not quite justified what this constant a is and so on in the next lecture we shall come to a slightly different approach to finding the impulse response and we shall justify this expression and precisely evaluate the value of a right thank you and we'll conclude this lecture here today